Well, good afternoon and welcome to Chapter 5. Uh, we're going to be covering criminal responsibility and capacity to commit crimes. So we're really kind of transitioning uh, to some defense issues here, but put that on hold for one second. As usual, we have um, a, uh, a two slides of learning objectives. Um, and again, these are... Uh, not vital that you know as you're going through them, but I think if you do read through them first and then keep them in mind as you're uh, viewing this lecture or listening to this lecture, I think you will get more out of it. These are the primary points that we're trying to ac accomplish in this chapter. So, you know, when we're talking about the insanity rule, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll bring up, for example, on number three here, the two prongs of the McNaughton rule. And we'll talk about the uh, distinguishing cognitive from uh, volatile approaches. Uh, we'll talk about the substantial capacity test, all those things that are listed there. Because we are, one of the things that we're really going to look at in this chapter, obviously gets capacity, is we're going to look at mental capacity. All right, so having uh, laid just that little bit of groundwork, groundwork there, let's, uh, let's go back in time. Um, I consider myself kind of an amateur historian, so uh, anytime I can find a good reason to uh, talk about the past, I certainly am going to spend a little time doing it. So um, how did uh, people before the modern age really address criminal responsibility? Well, uh, your book points out at least a couple ideas um, and how we recognized or didn't recognize. Um, one of which is trial by ordeal. Now, this is tied up in um, religious uh, ideals. Uh, one of the ideals, uh, famously, would be that if you were trying someone who was in league with evil, so it could be a witch or it could be someone who had committed a very heinous crime, uh, what you could do is you could throw them in a pond. And uh, reasoning by analogy, and this is a good example why that's not a great idea, water is a pure substance. That which is pure is that which is holy. That which is holy will reject that which is unholy. Evil is unholy. Therefore, if you throw the witch into the pond, the water will reject her and she'll float. So you fish her out and you burn her. Of course, you've got the problem that... Um, if she's innocent and the water doesn't reject her and she can't swim, well, she's at the bottom of the pond and odds are in the pre-industrial world, nobody can swim. Uh, so, you know, we've got a drowning innocent person at the bottom of the pond, not the best of uh, options. Another option, a little bit more common, was trial or ordeals where they would impose uh, various uh, physical... Um, physically difficult or physically painful things, and then they would observe the results. So one of the classic examples here is they would, before you would swear you were innocent, you would put a red hot piece of metal or stone in your hand, you would close your hand, swear you're innocent, drop the stone into a bucket of water or a pail of water, and then they would bind your hand. And if your, bind, your hand didn't fester and get infected, then you were uh, deemed to be telling the truth. If, however, you had lied, your lie had gotten into your wound and had infected you. That's obviously these are, are I don't want to say silly, but these are difficult ideas for us to accept in the 21st century where we know about germ theory or where we know that water is not a pure substance. <laughs> The uh, other major uh, idea of criminal responsibility could be trial by uh, combat, uh, or sometimes called trial by battle. This could arise uh, where you would, um, this often happened among nobles in the Middle Ages, so they would be disputing a piece of land or something, and they would each hire a champion sometimes to fight, and the two would fight, and the person who wins the battle meant that their cause was more just because the, the famous phrase is God protects the right. So if God would defend those who are battling for a good cause, then the good cause would triumph. Therefore, the right cause would triumph. Therefore, they win. Now, this seems, again, uh, 
kind of difficult for us to accept here in the 21st century. But remember, uh, the idea that you would hire someone to fight for you, and if they win, it proves you're right, is not exceedingly different than the idea that you would hire two private attorneys. They would engage in a competition to prove uh, truth. Uh, the winner of that competition, the winner of the trial, uh, would, would win. They would get the verdict. They would get the award. So, yes, there's, um, there's some problems, obviously, with a physical combat, but then I think one of the important things about criminal justice and studying these things is to examine our own blind spots. You know, are we really blind to the idea that uh, we're practicing a type of trial by combat? And do having two competing attorneys really arrive at the truth? Um, okay. So moving on, um, capacity and responsibility. Criminal responsibility and criminal capacity are seen as potential excuses, what the layman would often call defenses, well, that's not truly what they are, for the commission of an act, a criminal act. There are situations where individuals are not considered criminally liable for their actions. So your book quickly lists three here, and then we'll talk about more, and we'll actually develop each of these. Infancy, uh, as it is determined. Uh, infancy means your age at, at when the crime was committed, not the time we're having the trial. Insanity, or mental defect, and then incompetent defendants. So, um, the next thing, your book kind of jumps before addressing those, where it says, um, what about preponderance of the evidence here? Because remember, um, the criminal standard is proof beyond a reasonable doubt. But when you're talking about um, one of these issues, uh, the standard might not be you have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt uh, that someone is X, Y, or Z or has capacity, but rather by preponderance of the evidence. Uh, most states require that for insanity, you have to prove by a preponderance of the evidence, which is... Um, a substantial amount, and the burden is on the person claiming insanity. Uh, now, it took a long time. Uh, there was a great deal of opposition to it, uh, particularly from district attorneys, uh, but uh, recently, within the 21st century, the United States decided that they would not uh, execute people who not only were insane, which generally they were never executed once insanity became established, but also someone who suffers from uh, a high degree of mental retardation. And that's going to bring up issues about IQ and cognitive ability that we'll look at in one second. Okay, so let's, before we get to all those, let's look at infants. Um, again, American law is primarily descended from English law, so we have to go back and look at the original rules. Under English common law, which is the father of American law, a child that had not reached the age of seven could not be charged with a crime uh, because it was deemed to be that they lacked the mental capacity to formulate intent, nor could they comprehend the threat of punishment to deter. Now, those are two stated by your book, but you also have to remember that as the common law is developing, you're, you're dealing with a, single, uh, a singular Christian church. And within this church, there were different rites, uh, the seven sacraments classically. But, you know, there was the sacrament of baptism, and then there was the sacrament of confirmation, uh, which is a, a second uh, step. And... There is, a, there is a relationship here between the idea of, yes, you're born, and yes, you're a human being, you were baptized. But no, you're not fully into the community, like someone who has been confirmed in the church or someone who has reached a certain age. Now, today, um, states are free to set their ages of maturity for different things. So for the issue of pure liability for criminal law, um, generally, yeah, we follow a rule, different states, one through six, your, your, your first birthday through your sixth birthday, uh, 
you are an infant. After that, you can be charged. How do you prove infancy? Well, if you are under a certain age, um, you know, you can, obviously you can introduce birth certificates. Um, now, children under the minimum age uh, cannot be convicted of a crime. Even if you have someone, and again, let's suppose the state that we're looking at, I'll, I'll make up a state, Massachusetts, that their age of infancy is eight or nine. And we have a child that's seven, but he's a certified genius. He does calculus, he speaks 10 languages, and he commits a crime. It does not matter. That number is a hard number. It's a statutory number. Now, between ages, so let's take North Carolina, I said one through six, you're an infant, six on up, and the, the numbers get a little hazy here, but we'll certainly say 14, 16, maybe 18 for juveniles, but, but again, don't worry too much about that. Um, between the ages of seven and 14, there is a presumption you're a child. There is a presumption you can't be charged, but that can be overcome and we can treat you as an adult. So we will actually look into it. It's kind of like if you had someone that was suffering from a severe um, mental deficiency, um, even if they were 35, you might say that they have the intellect and maturity of a seven-year-old, but you're gonna have to prove that. So if you have someone who's 12 or 13, um, you would prove that they do not yet understand punishment, they don't understand their, their act. After a certain age, and again, this varies from state to state to state, and it, it also varies depending on what we're talking about. Are we talking about the age of consent to say marry? Are we talking about the age of consent to in, in, have sex? Are we talking about the age to commit uh, a crime? Um, are we talking about the age to buy alcohol? You know, all of these are different. Typically, though, we will pick an age um, and we will say, above this age, you're an adult, period. Now, state statutes typically will require um, individuals younger than, we'll just pick 18 as our number here, younger than 18 to be prosecuted through a juvenile court system. Now, most states, again, let's look at, say, a state of Illinois. What Illinois has done, I believe, is they have created an entirely separate juvenile court system. So you would go in front of someone that only handled juvenile courts. I know Pennsylvania does this. The same thing in Pennsylvania. Now, North Carolina, we did it a little bit, let's be honest, we did it cheaper. What we did is, yes, we have juvenile court judges, but there also are district court judges. So you would have someone like, I'm trying to think of an old district court judge uh, that used to, uh, Joyce Hamilton. Joyce Hamilton used to do, mo after Jerry Leonard left the base, who, uh, bench, who was a great judge, uh, Joyce uh, Hamilton here in Wake County did a lot of the juvenile court cases. So it would, um, a case could come before them. Now, a prosecution in different states has often discretion to, well, we want to remove it from the juvenile, or we want to leave it in the juvenile, um, or it only can be in the juvenile. So, for example, for homicide in North Carolina, um, the prosecution has a wide degree of discretion whether they want to try a 12 or 13 or 14 year old in North Carolina as an adult or a juvenile. Generally, the younger the child, the, the more evidence you're going to need to have to prove capacity to show you can try them as an adult. Okay, so juvenile court. Um, by the early part of the 20th century, a movement called the uh, Child Savers had really worked hard um, to establish a separate system for juveniles. And by the 1940s, every state in the United States had a separate, including North Carolina, juvenile court system. And one of the things we did here is we changed some of the language. We don't call it a crime. Um, we call it delinquency. And it's not punishment, it's a disposition. We don't focus on the punishment. In fact, the, the primary goal seems to be in juvenile courts rehabilitation. What can we do to rescue this child? Now, um, 
that was the goal through the mid part of the 20th century. Gradually, because of a get tough approach on crime, um, a lot of that shifted. And what we've seen now is that a lot more juveniles are tried as adults. Um, and there's a lot more prosecutorial, judicial, or legislative waiver of juvenile status to put people into the regular court system. It used to be that the juvenile courts, and here's a Latin term, uh, was essentially a loco parentis. In loco parentis means in the place of the parent. And it was supposed to be, what would a parent do here that would be best? And it's kind of shifted more towards the punishment aspect. Um, so we are seeing more juveniles moved over to adult court. All right, I, I promised you we'd start to talk about insanity. And as I do that, I, I want to start off with um, I want to start off with uh, an explanation first that insanity is not a medical term. Most students, when they start to study insanity, um, begin with the confused assumption that insanity is a diagnosis. It's not. Insanity is a legal term. It's a legal term that would embrace a number of mental illnesses or mental states that would rob someone of the capacity to commit a crime. Um, it is essentially an excuse. Having said that, it is a freakishly, freakishly rare defense. So, um, in the United States, there's, we'll, we'll just pick a, a common number for the last decade or so. Let's suppose there's 15,000 homicides in a given year. There are 10,000 homicides that are solved or cleared. Um, what your book says, and we'll take that, it's kind of a high number, but we'll take it. In 2% of the cases, um, people plead insanity. So out of 10,000 cases, you might have 200 people claiming it's end. It is almost unheard of for it to be successful. So in the 30 odd years that I practiced in Wake County, I saw exactly one successful plea of insanity that was opposed by the prosecution um, and was successful. It's rarely raised. When it's raised, it's almost never successful. All right, third point, if you're found insane, you are given a verdict of not guilty by reason of insanity. At this point, um, generally you will be confined to a mental institution. Now, the state has to establish that you are dangerous um, in order to put you in a mental institution, particularly one of close confinement. Um, and essentially your plea is, is letting them do that. It is difficult when your conviction, let's suppose you were charged with a uh, conviction that carried a 10 or 15 year sentence. After 15 years of mental institution, the state has to establish that not only are you still insane to retain you there, but that you are dangerous. And they have to do so not by preponderance of the evidence, but they have to show clear and convincing evidence that you're insane and dangerous. And if they don't, they gotta let you out. Having said that, freakishly rare, freakishly rare. Okay, uh, we got this picture. Um, this is uh, Robert Deere who killed three persons at a um, Planned Parenthood Center in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Uh, the judge ruled him uh, to be incompetent to stand trial for reasons of mental insanity. Okay, how do we determine insanity? What, what standard are we going to use? So, very few states require the prosecution to prove sanity. In fact, the, in almost everyone, the burden is on the defendant to prove by a preponderance of the evidence that they're insane, because you are raising a defense. It's much like you're trying to prove self-defense. So there are different tests. 
Um, the three ones that your book is talking about here, the McNaughton rule, the product rule, and the substantial capacity rule. Uh, the McNaughton is a cognitive incapacity, moral incapacity uh, argument. The product rule is that the insanity is a result of a diagnosed mental illness, severe mental illness, and substantial capacity is really volative, uh, in, volative incapacity, and, and we'll get to that one in one second. So um, here's a discussion question for you guys to look at. That is an interesting video it came out of Fox News about James Holmes' insanity plea. I, I'll we'll let you look at that. It comes out of the California. Okay, so let's look at the big one. And it's good that we start with this one because North Carolina essentially uses a modified McNaughton rule. So the McNaughton rule, or the right or wrong test, what we're saying is you are not legally responsible, forget about moral, but legally responsible, if there is some defect of mind, which you could read as a mental illness, at the time you committed the crime such that you were incapable of understanding the difference between right and wrong. So let's take a delusional state. You believe that you were going into your own house. In fact, you were suffering a schizophrenic episode or you were having an adverse reaction to, I don't know, Ambien, and you were going into your neighbor's house. And now they want to charge you with breaking and entering. And you say, well, no, I wasn't aware. Uh, I was not in my right mind. I was unable to know that this would be the wrong thing to do. So we look at cognitive and moral incapacity there. Did you understand what you were doing? Did you know what the acts were? Because sometimes you get a mental illness that you think you're walking the dog. In fact, you're burning down a house. Um, and then there is moral incapacity. You didn't know. You might have known you were doing something that was potentially bad. You might be knowing you were hurting someone, shooting someone. But you might believe, oh my God, it's it's a dragon. I've got to shoot the dragon. When you were shooting the neighbor's dog. Um, James Holmes, um, if, if you recall, if you watched that previous one, um, this was back in 2012, I think it was when uh, one of the Batman movies came out, um, one of the good Batman movies came out, and he kind of dressed up as the Joker, and he went into a movie theater, um, and he shot at random. He, um, he was found sane. Uh, he clearly suffered from some mental illnesses, but under the Colorado version of the McNaughton rule, you couldn't prove that he lacked the mental, he lacked the cognitive ability or the moral ability. So he was found guilty. He got um, 11 life terms and 3,318 additional years. So obviously, even with good time, if you can cut it in half, he'll be out in 1,500 years. Okay, so what's an alternative? Uh, vocational incapacity, or what's sometimes called the irresistible impulse. Um, you know it's wrong, but you can't resist because of a mental illness. So this is really removing the kind of moral issue here. This started as an addition to McNaughton, um, and it has, has become really a separate test. And, and usually it's not called product of mental illness rule or uh, volatational incapacity or resistible impulse. It's typically, I, I've seen it most of the time, the Durham rule. Most states don't use the Durham rule. North Carolina does not. Um, substantial capacity test, the really third big one. Um, substantial capacity is used to determine if it is based on can you distinguish between right and wrong, do, can you conform your conduct to the requirements of law? Um, about half the states use something like this. And, uh, you know, this is, a, I, think, I think this one where that, that second sentence there, uh, sociopathic or psychopathic behavior, uh, is excluded from mental illness or defect definition because of potential for repeat offenses. I think all of these bring up the issue of um, they were all developed before we knew much about mental illness. 
Um, we simply, the McNaughton rule, for example, was created in the 1800s. It's been modified and changed a little bit. But we know far more about mental illness today than we ever have. We, we recognize that there are different forms of mental illness. We recognize that there are different uh, types of uh, psychotic behavior. Um, we recognize different types of treatment, different types of awareness. We know now that some have genetic links, that some have biochemical links. Um, the big problem here is, and this is my profession's problem, is that we are woefully behind the times. No one has sat down and, and constructed a 21st century model of mental capacity and developed a plea from it. As a result, you see some of these different defenses getting raised, um, and some of the things you would say, well, that person seems to me pretty, pretty mentally ill, but it's not going to fit in these old definitions. Okay, so what are some things that are not insanity defenses? Voluntary use of drug or alcohol, if, if they lead you to a delusional. So you, you drink, you have a delusion, you commit a crime, you do not have an insanity defense. Compulsive gambling, television intoxication, premenstrual syndrome, or cultural defenses, um, none of those have been deemed sufficient. And in fact, some states have gone so far, and these are primarily Western states with the exception of Kansas, They've just gotten rid of the insanity plea. It's just gone. Um, so North Carolina hasn't gone that far, but it's certainly, uh, I will remind you, a very rare plea that we almost never see. Okay, so what happens if you are found insane? Um, most states are going to mandate that if there is a verdict of not guilty by reason of sanity, that you are committed to a mental institution. At that point, release date is subjective. It's pretty much up to the state. Now, if it's going to be, remember, if it's going to be longer than the sentence you faced, if the sentence you faced was a 20-year sentence and you are incarcerated, um, yeah, you're probably going to serve 20 years, I'm betting. But beyond that, the state's going to really have to make effort to retain you. If you want to be released, you have to prove that you are no longer insane and you do not present um, a danger to the public. Most states will have specific statutory terms, and usually these terms and, re and releases are tied to the prison sentence you avoided. Um, there are actually, uh, I know Oregon, for example, runs a special holding unit for people who have served their time in a mental institution, but are deemed to be still dangerous. Um, and so they are being essentially civilly confined uh, potentially for the rest of their life. One of the options that developed in the latter half of the 20th century is a different verdict, and this verdict is guilty but mentally ill. And we do this because we recognize, or at least some states recognize, and this is a completely statutory creature, that someone could be convicted of a crime but they could have a mental illness that could impact it. So um, this is often either a substitute or a replacement or an alternative to not guilty. Um, it, what this purportedly does is recognizes there are degrees of mental impairment and promotes treatment over punishment but also eliminates the ability of someone to just manipulate the system. I'm just going to leave it at that. I'm just going to leave it at that. Okay, not guilty but mentally ill. The state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that you're guilty, that you are mentally ill, but you are not insane. At that point, you are guilty but mentally ill. Um, so you can look at this one if you like. This is a... Um, uh, it comes out of a TV station, uh, KSL, I'm not sure. But uh, she's accused of killing her daughter in a murder-suicide attempt. Um, not mentally, not insane, but mentally ill. And what penalties are we going to look at for here? Okay. Let's look at some of the things that might trigger mental conditions that are not enough to get you to, to insanity. So I will say this. Most successful insanity pleas are going to plead some, uh, the underlying illness 
is going to be some type of schizophrenia. And schizophrenia at its simplest, most basic, common man type definition is you are unable to distinguish reality. You do not perceive objective reality. You do not react to it. Um, instead, you perceive falsehoods and react to those. So you might see a dragon, or you might uh, see a Nazi with a gun when it's a cop, or you might see a, uh, uh, a tank when it's a car. Um, you might see a dragon when it's a dog. So there are, however, illnesses that can arise, and we'll look at a couple of them, um, that clearly have some sort of we recognize at least that they are change, they change the mind. So let's take the first one, and this is, this is the one I think for students it's easiest to accept, the battered women syndrome. So it goes something like this. If, you, if a woman is subjected to essentially torture, uh, is placed in a situation where she is uh, beaten and abused, um, physically abused, sexually abused, she can reach a state that is not the state of insanity, but is the state where she sees that her only option is to commit a crime. That's not insanity, but it might be viewed as a, a mitigating factor. And you can go from there all the way down. Um, often people will take into account these things um, in either, hopefully, in charging, because remember the prosecution has a non-reviewable uh, power to take a look at what's being charged, or in sentencing. So either the prosecution or the judge will um, take into account that, yes, this woman shot her boyfriend or her husband, um, but he was beating her. Uh, it didn't rise to the level of insanity. It might not have been perfect self-defense. Um, but we need to take it into account. Sometimes we use the term diminished capacity, which again is not a complete defense. It's more one of these defenses that can be used to kind of push the prosecution off of, um, off of a conviction for a more serious crime. Now, if successful, if you have a legal insanity defense, the court has control. It, it gives the judge a lot of control, and very often they will order commitment in almost all cases. If you have a diminished capacity to defense, the court does not have that authority. So if you said, well, the reason he did this was the diminished capacity, they recognized it, you're acquitted because of a diminished capacity issue, um, then the courts don't get to keep an eye on you. All right, competency to stand trial. A person whose mental condition is such that he or she lacks the capacity to understand the nature and the object of the proceeding against him or her to consult with counsel, assist in preparing his defense, may not be subjected to trial. So I was reading, uh, I was reading a couple cases recently about this. One was uh, a couple of the defendants in the Nuremberg trials, some of the Nazis that were caught after the Second World War. A couple of them were, were basically found incompetent uh, mental illness. Uh, but I was, um, you know, I was also looking at a few different cases where um, it was pretty clear that a person uh, was incapable of assisting in their defense. And there are some that I would have thought would have been successful, but a competency issue, but were not. And I would refer you to the case of uh, Padilla versus Rumsfeld. But basically, if a defendant, at, when trial comes, um, cannot help, doesn't know what's going on, can't assist counsel, can't testify, then you've either got to dismiss the case or bring civil commitment. So generally insanity is judged at the time you commit the act, but competency is judged at the time of trial. Um, now sometimes we say you're competent but you're not competent to be your own lawyer. It's well established that people have the right to defend themselves. It's usually a tremendously bad idea. The legal maxim is 
Anybody that defends himself has a fool for a client. Uh, but sometimes we'll say, okay, you're competent enough to stand trial, but you're not competent enough to be an attorney. Civil commitment is what generally happens here. Usually we prove that you are an ongoing danger uh, to yourself or others. Um, very often you're a sex criminal, uh, a rapist, a uh, pedophile, something like that. And a civil commitment can be ongoing. It can in many ways be permanent. Um, criminal liability corporations. Now, this is very difficult. Um, under the law, corporations are technically people. However, it's not they're not fully people under the criminal sense. They're, they're, they're fully people under the civil law sense. They can sue, be sued, they can be liable, they can be non-liable, they commit negligence, non-negligence, they commit a tort or, or, or not. But under the criminal law, um, we do limit liability for corporations. Now, also, in theory, if a corporation is bad enough, referring back to this, a corporation can be essentially suffer the death penalty, which is, wow, you are such a bad corporation, we're going to shut you down completely. But most states limit this. Um, and it's very difficult for states to apply um, criminal law to corporations, because a corporation, essentially, they, all you can really do is find it. And they're going to pass that on to its shareholders or its customers uh, or the general public, and people say, well, that, that's not helpful. So there's really never been a satisfactory solution to the issue of criminal corporate liability. What would be the purpose of making corporations liable? What kind of crimes would be appropriate? Um, are there crimes that they should not be held appropriate for? Those would all be good questions to discuss. All right. On that note, um, I hope you enjoyed the lecture. We are going to pick up with um, the next chapter whenever you're ready.